What do you picture when you think of embroidery? Perhaps floral motifs or a cross-stitch square. And if you imagine the person patiently stitching, that person is most likely a woman. The historical association between embroidery and the female world has condemned it to be seen largely as a hobby, but it's more artistic and intimate than that, a method of secretly sharing stories in plain view. During the last decade, embroidery has made a big comeback, recovering its subversive side. Because before machines relegated it to the domestic sphere, embroidery was a language that helped us to understand our place in the world. Then finally on February 16th, 1923, King Tut's fabulous tomb was unearthed. Carloads of relics as well as the young king's mummy were removed. Among the relics of King Tut's tomb was the oldest surviving embroidered object, from a time when social status was exhibited with ornamental pieces, which were displayed on the bodies of only the most powerful. In the Americas, thousands of years before its great empires formed, embroidery was already in practice. As demonstrated by these embroidered pieces uncovered in an ancient cemetery along the Peruvian coast. In China, Silk had long been the most highly prized fabric, as proven by the robes found in royal tombs. But it was the Han Dynasty that established the Silk Road by expanding its trade routes throughout Central Asia. The silk trade created a network of cultural exchange that was reflected in the highly coveted embroidered pieces that it produced. Along the route, Chinese patterns mixed with Persian and Arabic art, creating a universal language made up of floral motifs and geometric patterns. In France, it was used to decorate the borders of garments, which is where the word embroidery comes from. But embroidery wasn't just used on clothing. It was also used to immortalize history. The Bayou Tapestry is the oldest surviving embroidered tapestry, depicting the Battle of Hastings across 70 meters of fabric. Anglo-Saxon artisans created a blend of gold and silver thread on velvet, which was only used for sacred religious objects. Known as Opus Anglicanum, these pieces were so coveted that the Pope himself owned 113 of them. Embroidery made with precious metals became a symbol of power. Then, Queen Catherine of Aragon introduced England to monochromatic blackwork embroidery. Beauty no longer became based solely on shine, but also on embroidery's complexity and its elegant patterns. Trends influenced traditional embroidery styles, as was the case of the Mesoamerican Huipil, whose patterns reflected the impact of colonialism. The Huipil was a garment common to all social classes, because beyond luxury and ostentation, embroidery was also a symbol of identity. Among the lower classes, embroidery was done with whatever materials were available. Many traditional embroidery styles emerged for practical reasons, like the Japanese shashiko, originally a way to mend garments. Royalty didn't wear the style of embroidery, and it wasn't used to decorate temples. Instead, these pieces were passed down from generation to generation, increasing in value because of their place in a larger legacy. Then, machines revolutionized embroidery. Giant looms deftly worked thread and rapidly sped up production. The jacquard loom wove complex patterns of brocade and damask fabrics using a punch card system, the precursor to future data systems such as telegraphs and early computers. 
And later on, the Shipley embroidery machine would entirely automate the process. Human hands were no longer needed. Progressively, these machines spread across the world, with hand embroidery being relegated to the domestic sphere. Embroidery was one on a long list of the skills expected of an ideal wife, and it reflected idealized female qualities, such as patience, daintiness, attentiveness, and submission. But embroidery also offered a space for self-expression, where many women could leave their mark on the objects around them, creating their own works of art. Pattern books facilitated learning the technique, and people practiced making samplers. Some included Bible verses, proverbs, or personal reflections, like morning embroidery. In this embroidery from the late 19th century, a mother says goodbye to her deceased infant. This place that once knew him will know him no more. Embroidery became a medium to share sentiments that maybe couldn't be engraved in stone or published in the newspaper, but that reflected the start of a larger societal shift that was about to come. The first waves of feminism rejected the restrictions of centuries-old gender roles. It was time to leave the domestic sphere. At the same time, technological advances and the invention of synthetic fibers changed the way we dress forever. The modern world was minimalist. Embroidery was a thing of the past, whether it was kitsch, folkloric, religious, a craft, or a relic. But after decades of technological advances and massive mass production, making something with your hands has grown to become a radical act. Embroidery makes us feel like the creators of something authentic and unique. And even if patterns have been adapted to modern aesthetics, the techniques we use today are still the same ones that have wound their way through centuries of history.